Hello, hello. Alex, how are you? Oh, I'm great. How are you? Very good, very good. That's very nice to hear. That that time of the week again, the space time. Absolutely. How's how's your side of the side of the globe? Eh, you know, same side. Last time with last space, or maybe it was the one before. There was a sandstorm. Ah, yeah, the one before that. No, it's a, that that has passed. Now it's okay. uh, it's it's yeah, it's looking much better now. Nice, nice. Yeah. Um, so uh, <laughs> we, we we have quite a lot of interesting things to talk about today. But uh, first, I have to ask you: Did you already sign up to open uh, an uh, Bitcoin ETF fund? <laughs> uh, no, the announcement will be made in the in the coming days with, I'm sure, a, a few other players. It it seems like just everyone, you know, and their grandmothers are opening Bitcoin ETFs now. Yeah, it was so weird. And it, and it came like very soon after all these attacks on crypto. And then there was someone, I forget who it was, it was some like big TradFi guy. Uh, and he said like, crypto seems ripe for a TradFi takeover. And then all this garbage started happening, <laughs> which I thought was pretty funny. Absolutely. Yeah, the timing is amazing as usual. I mean, <laughs> yeah. uh, if you ever wanted conspiracy theories, this is yeah. like your chance to spin each and every one of them. <laughs> yeah, Unbelievable. true. Unbelievable. What, do you, what do you reckon will happen? Do you think that some of them will get approved now that it's like the... Yeah, I mean, boys rather than crypto I, think, fine. I think what's happening is that, first of all, uh, like Bitcoin is, is cleared, right? That, that's kind of the consensus. Bitcoin is cleared in yeah. terms of they know how to work with it. They know how to trace it. Uh, you know, everything is fine. So now uh, it, we see that all of these uh, SEC allegations, they are talking about many different projects. Bitcoin is not anywhere near uh, that. It's considered a pure kind of uh, non-security, you know, as, as non-security as it can be. Yeah. So, yeah, so definitely uh, Bitcoin is going to go up, in my opinion, not a trading advice, but uh, I mean, yeah, like that's definitely. And we, we saw already that uh, the dominance is uh, at like two year high and uh, uh, prices are starting to go up. And uh, yeah, so the institutional money will definitely and make some changes. Now, whether it's good for the uh, crypto in the long term, uh, I'm not sure. Because, you know, yeah, like, uh, it, it was always this kind of wait till the institutional money comes in. But uh, it's also a question of like, how well uh, Bitcoin manages to maintain the good things about crypto, which is decentralization and sovereignty and all that. So we will see how that turns out. Yeah, absolutely. And there was some there was some weird like wording in the I don't know if it was like just legal protection stuff, but there was some weird wording in some of the ETF filing papers or whatever about like we will if there was a fork or whatever we will track we will choose which one to track. Yes. Essentially. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. You're right. It, it was actually very interesting. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's just the beginning of, of this story, I think, and uh, we will follow it and see how it develops. Uh, but uh, it, it's definitely going to help, in my opinion, Bitcoin definitely in the short term to go up. And, um, uh, you know, since everything is kind of correlated, I think the whole market will be uh, trending a little bit upwards as a result. But then we will see how, because, you know, the United States is not the entire world after all. And uh, we will see yeah. how other uh, parts of the world react to this news. Uh, eventually, it could be really big. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I and, yeah. and and if I understand right, some of the other places outside of the U.S. already have like Bitcoin ETFs. Yeah, just not. Yeah, US uh, in, in Europe, okay. uh, I'm aware of a couple of companies that are doing this, uh, and obviously there are many more around the world that I, I don't know about. Uh, but yeah, it's it's something that uh, uh, is already happening. But uh, th there are two questions here. The first is the question of uh, uh, kind of volume, right? How, like how much money yeah. is going in, and also it's the question of how these funds will be rated, who will be allowed to invest in them, and uh, this is uh, sure. this can change things significantly. Yeah, it will for sure be interesting to see like what effect it has on on everything essentially. absolutely
Yeah, so the second story that was very funny and I laughed, I mean, it was so crazy, is Binance again. Uh, they announced that they are delisting a bunch of privacy coins uh, in several European countries following local regulation and there was a long list there and then they published this update uh, with a much shorter list and they said, wait a second, so actually some of the coins on that list are, are like, are okay, so they're not like private enough. Uh, and, and then there is a short list, which is funny because of two reasons. First of all, uh, BIM is on both of those lists, even though BIM, as you know, is not traded on Binance for a while now. Yeah. Uh, but also, if they just, you know, would publish the short list uh, initially, it would have been okay, so I don't know, maybe something. But since they first published the long list, that included Zcash and included Secret and some other projects. And then they published the short list. They actually made a great, you know, PR for us because they said, <laughs> but we, we checked more carefully and actually Zcash is not as private, you know, so you, you can uh, trade it. And uh, it's the same for Secret and many other projects. However, Beam and Monero and uh, Firo and, uh, you know, a couple of others like Zen was there. Uh, they, they are actually private, so no, we cannot trade them. So it was we could we could not have bought a better uh, advertisement for ourselves. Absolutely. So they officially stated that okay, those are you know, will the real privacy coins please stand up? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I actually laughed a lot, and I didn't have to include Beam in either of those lists. I'm very thankful that they did. Uh, because, yeah, it, it was very nice thing uh, being mentioned alongside Monero. And, uh, yeah, I think I think it's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, like, it, it would, <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny because, like, uh, they didn't need to, to mention Beam. So it's, it's quite a, a cool thing that they somehow There was this did. tweet that I reacted to. Uh, somebody said, like, why would you use Zcash if you're using uh, open transactions? Just use Bitcoin or yeah. whatever. And somebody said, you know, when I started to use Zcash, I didn't understand there are open transactions, so I thought they were confidential. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I, man. I, this I think this is probably very common from, like, your kind of, like, uh, hobbyist crypto people. It's it's more. I don't know if it's more sad or, or, or scary or or both. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this was. I remember seeing a port a, a report. It was a few years ago now, but it was something like the. It was talking about like Silk Road and like how payments to Silk Road were being made, and most of the payments were like not only like Bitcoin, but they were Bitcoin from like Coinbase. And I just thought, oh no, like they, I, I hope that they just don't know. Like, <laughs> or I, I don't know if that's what I hope. I hope they don't know, or I hope they like are, are so wild that they're okay with it or whatever. I don't know which I, I was hoping for. This is interesting, especially in terms of, uh, you know, all of these ETFs now, they're going to be obviously screening for. You know, Bitcoin origin and uh, history using Chainalysis or similar companies. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, the fungibility here is, is really questionable and we will see how, how it works out in terms of creating a, uh, you know, better Bitcoins, worse Bitcoins, so all kinds of Bitcoins. Why, yeah. why and and another, yeah. another kind of interesting thing was like the, the regulations that came out or like not came out, the pseudo like attack or whatever it was on Binance and, and also Coinbase to a lesser degree and then I think it was the BlackRock ETF filing said that they were going to use Coinbase as their like custodian if I remember right mm. uh, and I found that kind of interesting it's, it's difficult to understand what exactly is going on <laughs> yeah yeah it is like uh, everything is who... changing so fast yeah, and I couldn't, like, when everyone's like, oh, they were talking about BlackRock and, like, they've only failed one ETF, like, application out of 570 or something like that. Hmm. And I thought, like, who's, who, who has more power, like, the, the SEC and, and old Gaz Gensler or, like, the BlackRock and whoever's in charge of that? And I don't know. But 
interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's that's absolutely. Right. So yeah, B Bitcoin Bitcoin is uh, it, it's the next step of the adoption kind of cycle because uh, yeah, it, it was always the case that Bitcoin is leading in many categories, and then kind of other uh, cryptocurrencies uh, move along, and uh, so so this is the next. Uh, step in that in that process that you know now the bitcoin is completely okay now everybody is going to trade it three ETFs or whatever uh, because you know it, it would not have been uh, the case that everybody applies at the same time if they thought that it you know they might not get it or they, they got yeah they got a green light from somewhere else yeah i'd say so they've they've had a, a group chat on <laughs> telegram or wherever they hang out <laughs> yeah would love to see the chat. I'm sure it's funny. Yeah, someone's someone's pinned a message, given them the okay. <laughs> oh my god, this is crazy world. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> so our main topic tonight is Web three, um, and actually, like I, I'm really excited to talk about it because it will also allow me to uh, organize and kind of express my thoughts because I was thinking and kind of doing some research about it for for a while now. Um, and um, so, first of all, Web3 uh, is a, a very broad umbrella term covering a lot of different things. And I just want to make sure that we focus on just one kind of aspect, because I don't want to talk about NFTs too much. I don't want to talk about DeFi too much. But I do want to talk about non-financial uh, Web3 applications. Yeah. And I was doing this you know, just as you would start any any research, Google searches and going to Reddit communities, some of them were dark because of the protests uh, on Reddit, which we're also going to mention. And uh, I didn't find um, too much, like I found much less information than I expected to, considering that Web3 has been around for, for a while now as, as an idea, as a term, as a uh, concept. And I was surprised to find very little high like, quality material about it. now there there are some articles that are very broad and generic saying something like uh, oh yeah you have like your nfts and uh, collecting as a business model which is okay but i mean come on and uh you have your like DeFi, obviously and things like that and also i found several communities but most of those communities even though they call themselves web3 they're actually focused around specific platforms such as solana uh, or like other um, uh, there is this um, project called what's its name? Soul Soulshell. Soulshell. Have you ever heard about it? No, don't think I. It's have. a decentralized social network uh, of sorts. Okay. Yeah, uh, it actually looks very nice. And uh, so there is this uh, Web three community that only talks about social. So you, you understand that it was probably created by by members from that community. So. A lot of uh, different uh, uh, materials that are very generic, very low level, very not interesting, and uh, uh, very little actual research or talk about, especially about the business models and a lot of things. So <clears throat> what I would like to do today is to kind of organize like everything that I found and tell you about it. Uh, and, uh, you know, discuss it. And, and I think there is, it's actually an interesting opportunity in, in many, many different ways. Absolutely. And I, and I think a lot of these, like, as we've discussed before, like a lot of these social applications and applications outside of like straight up finance are, are more interesting and also more relevant for, for far more people. No, totally. I, I understand. But uh, what, what's uh, the, like, I understand the case for DeFi completely. We're doing DeFi and Beam. For, like it's, it's all it's all good. But when we come to non-financial uh, applications, so first of all, like wh why do we like why Web three? In my opinion, is a good idea, and I think it's uh, important because right now we are at this point where Web two, uh, the current internet as we know it has failed us not in everything obviously it works great but in some important regards which are related to uh like what was the the social contract like so you, you you're using an application for free right you go to the internet you create a gmail account and you have a mail which is completely free to you but you allow the company google in this case to use some of your information to basically show you ads because that's a 
that's the model that they're using, right? That's where the revenue comes from, from the ads. Yeah. And then we discover that, wait a second, so it's not just ads, it's basically collecting all of the data that you have ever you know, uploaded to any service, connecting them all together, using it for anything you want, whether it's by the company or by the government or both. And at some point, you also lose control. So there is this deplatforming de going on. Like, for example, what we see now with Reddit, I think is a great example, even though we will talk about it, it's like it's not very simple to solve. But what's happening is that you have a platform which is very powerful and it wants to monetize. So it raises prices for the API and the communities object because, as you know, on Reddit, moderators are not paid. So they are doing a lot of important work for the platform, for their communities without getting paid. So they yeah. try to say, listen, we, we, we are, we are p- opposed, we protest this, this move. And uh, uh, then the platform takes over, removes the moderators, opens the communities uh, and forces the, their will on, on those communities. And this is where the struggle begins. So in general, those communities don't necessarily need to be on Reddit. They can be anywhere, but you know that's the power of the platform. Okay, so... The, this is the, the the situation, and this dynamic we see it all the time across different different domains. GitHub uh, delisting or like removing the repositories for Tornado Cash when there was a like you know uh, when Tornado Cash was uh, added to the offer list, and uh, uh, then there was a struggle around that. And you have uh, YouTube blocking videos, and you have Twitter blocking accounts. So it. These platforms were, became so, so successful, and uh, now they are very powerful. And they are like they they have to. It's not like they want to, but they have to moderate a lot of things, and uh, uh, it creates this disbalance. And also, you don't own anything. You don't own your data. You don't own uh, nothing because uh, they say, "Listen, we give you the product for free." And you know this saying: "When you don't pay for the product, you are the product." Product. Yeah. Uh, so I think that Web3 and the blockchain technologies can do something about it. And I just want to start with kind of the limitations, right? Because uh, if one of the most immediate like knee-jerk reactions uh, was to replace like the decentralized Twitter, decentralized Facebook, decentralized this and that. And yeah. it's not very simple because the scalability model for Twitter specifically and Facebook and social networks of this kind is very uh, imbalanced. So you have one person, let's say Elon Musk, with millions of followers. And whenever he says something, like announcing that he's going to fight Zuckerberg in the ring, I mean, <laughs> this world is getting crazier by the moment. Uh, yeah. So all of his millions of followers need to know about it immediately. And that's how it works. It's very difficult to replicate that model with decentralized technology because decentralized technology is better suited for kind of smaller relatively smaller groups and more balanced communication. So it's not like one to very, very many, it's rather like one to many or like many to one or many to many, but in a smaller uh, proportions than car- what currently is available on Twitter and Facebook. And uh, the feed construction, like all of these mechanisms are not as simple to implement in the centralized world. So I think that it will take time uh, before big social networks uh, will be replicated in decentralized Web3 way. And I think it's a good thing. I think it's it's good because we don't want to just replace a technology stack and create the same kind of you know, monstrosities or very big platforms. What we want to have is maybe small platforms connected in a better way, but with much more... Um, local governance and you know management the community as a this self uh, you know self contained uh, entity and if it reminds you of a dao concept uh, that's because that's exactly that you have decentralized autonomous community in this case which has its own governance structure its own moderators does its own thing and uh, is not related to a big platform, except for the infrastructure, obviously. So the infrastructure is neutral. It does not enforce, like the, the hard drive doesn't care what you're storing it, and the internet or the network doesn't care what you send. 
it doesn't say, oh, you are doing this, so we will ban you, right? Uh, obviously, to, to some extent, but it's not like on Twitter, like, oh, this account looks like a bot, let's ban it, right? Yeah. Um, so th this is kind of the first thought that I had. And uh, it, it will become something like an kind of archipelago of, you know, islands, which once again are connected. You can go between them very easily, uh, but it's not longer like you're going to Reddit and then you're going to slash R something. You're going to, you want a Bitcoin community, you go to Bitcoin community. Uh, you don't care where it is. You don't see the Reddit logo there. You see the Bitcoin community logo there because it's their thing, right? So it's kind of a, a little bit back, back uh, to the days of uh, forums, you know, and uh, yeah. Uh, in some ways, it looks, uh, it looks like something that, that we already saw in the early uh, you know, 2000s, uh, but, um, uh, but with a different spin on it, because now it's, you know, it's on the blockchain, so we have uh, kind of more, um, you know, uh, more control on what you're doing. Yeah, uh, kind of like a Bitcoin talk. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, this is the first thing. The second thing is that it will take a, lo a long time for some things that uh, we are really used to, but they're not really working anymore. So, for example, let's take email. Do you use email? Oh, I try and avoid using emails. And if I look at my computer screen, I have 14,759 unread Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Software. Yeah. And I say, like, <laughs> raise your hand if you are in the same situation. Obviously, most of us are in this situation. And it yeah. was an interesting case because I was talking to um, uh, some people like that uh, about how email works, like why, what, what are the big challenges in making it decentralized? And there are a few challenges with very interesting origins. So first of all, you know, you can set up a web, uh, uh, like an email server in your house in five minutes. The problem is that no email that you send from this server will ever reach anyone. And I'm not just huh. talking about getting into spam, like it will not even be sent. Because yes. what happened is that email became very popular. It was very cheap, both to set up, maintain, and obviously it costs nothing to send. So people started using it for spamming. And in order to avoid spamming, what happened is that few major email providers, they have organized those blacklists of, you know, and whitelists uh, of who is allowed to send email and who is not. And this is why today you only have a very few options uh, to send email in a way that it will actually reach anyone because otherwise it will be just filtered out along the way in one of the services uh, that are basically they just don't want to pay for traffic and, uh, you know, people can send billions of emails a second and they don't want to pay for that. They don't, don't want to store it, to propagate it. So they say, okay, we, we understand that most of the email is spam anyway. And after all that, I think 95% of email in my, in my box is spam. Yeah, definitely. So after all of these efforts, it, it, it's still not helping like, too much. Now... It's difficult to get into this short list of providers that are actually deciding who is, you know, who is, who should be forwarded and who is not. Um, but I don't think this, the email model even works anymore. Like the second thing that everybody uses email for is authorization, because a lot of websites today still provide email as the key authorization option, and this is how they uh, make sure, like, authenticate you, uh, you create unique. Uh, user entries in their databases, and uh, when you reset your password, that's where your password comes. So this is also uh, one of the key uses for email today. And once again, it's also not not ideal because well, it, it, why do we use uh, two-factor authentication? Because email is unreliable; it can be spoofed, it can be intercepted, it's not encrypted. Uh, so th that's why it's not good enough anymore. And we all have. Uh, all kinds of uh, or hardware keys or authenticator applications to, to kind of add on that. So this use of email is also a bit outdated. Uh, a lot of applications provide social login when you log in with Facebook or you log in with Twitter, but it's also a yeah. problem because it means that those companies, Twitter or Facebook, are actually providers of your identity to those applications. And that's not ideal because, as we said, we don't necessarily want to trust them with these things. 
So, yeah. And yeah. also, also when you do this, some of them like ask for weird approvals. Like I, I've, I've linked my Twitter or like gone to link my Twitter account to a few things. And like the, the permissions that they're asking for are kind of wild. Like they can block accounts, unfollow people, like see everything. Some of it's wild. It's not just like get your publicly available Twitter yeah, account. Yeah, yeah. Like when, when you're doing this uh, with uh, with your social profiles, uh, it's uh, it's built in a way. And uh, so there is a reason because they want to allow for applications that perform many yeah. different tasks for you. But the end result is sometimes you give uh, approval uh, for things that you expect they should not need. Um, yeah. Just like when you install uh, this kind of, uh, I don't know, flashlight, or weather application, suddenly it wants access to all of your photos. And like, why do you need? <laughs> uh, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's how you determine the weather by looking at my photos. I don't get it. So yeah, that's, that's definitely a problem as well. Um, I read an interesting article in Coindesk of all places uh, a few days ago about the fact that uh, users don't care whether they use like Web3 or Web2 or whatever, and uh, it, they just want a good experience. Uh, and uh, so far, Web3 doesn't provide a better experience than Web2, and that's why it's failing in, in the adoption. And it's a good point because I don't want users to really think about what they're using, Web3 or Web2. It's not the point. It's like, yeah, us geeks, obviously, we, we, we like when we understand how things work and what we're using and why. Uh, and that's why all, all of these people that are focused on privacy are kind of fighting which browser to use and which VPN to use and like which uh, private coin to use. That's all fine. But for average consumers, that's not relevant. However, uh, I don't think that's how the change in this specific domain should be it should be done because we don't want to get into Linux situation. So Linux uh, is a great operating system for, for servers, but it's really terrible still, even in 2023, for consumers on laptops or desktops and end users. Uh, despite, uh, and I know probably a lot of people will say, no, you don't understand, you can do this, you can do that. Yes, but uh, for, you know, my mother or people who are not very technical, it's still a pain in the ass. And even for me, I mean, uh, when I, kind of every once in a while, there are these weird things like, uh, you know, the headphones with Bluetooth stop working and all these kinds of problems that you suddenly need to become crazy technical to solve. So when it works, it works well, but when it doesn't, you need to dig into a lot of technical documentation to find what's wrong with it. We don't want Web3 to become the next Linux, something that like only technical or big people are interested in uh, in, their, in their daily life. Uh, I think that the more appropriate model to think about it is something about the car safety, right? So. Uh, recently, my wife was in, in Europe and she was, went to this car museum and she sent me photos of all kinds of interesting cars from different eras. And, this, and she said something like, oh, like the design was much prettier back then. And yeah, uh, it was. However, a lot of things were removed because of all kinds of regulations, safety regulations, but not just, you know, because uh, somebody said so. But yeah, we, we found out that it's much safer to have a car which is uh, built in a certain way. And uh, uh, for example, um, like there are all of these protruding like headlights, opening headlights. You remember that was the time it was very, um, very fashionable to have uh, headlights that open. Uh, someone who was the guy that made them really famous in one of the like old school action films. I can't remember, but he had a had a very cool car with the like flip up. Lights yeah, yeah, and, and and yeah, it's it's nice. However, it's not legal anymore. They don't make those cars anymore. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, my brother owns... That's why we don't see them. <laughs> that, exactly. My brother owns yeah. uh, a 30-year-old uh, Mazda uh, 323F, uh, which had those headlights. And it was the last year, uh, back in 1993, that they made it because it, it became... Uh, uh, you know, illegal in some way. And the reason is that when you, uh, like, it's much less safe uh, to, to pedestrian if you hit somebody, right? And there is this protruding uh, headlight, so it's, it's, it's not as safe as having kind of slick surface. 
uh, and that's that's gone, right? So there are a lot of changes now. For example, you have the seat belt mandatory, and you have the certain uh, uh, brake light at a certain height. So there are a lot of regulations that came from like thinking about it, analyzing like what's safe, what's not, and we came to accept it. And we don't need to understand how it works, but when we buy a car, we we understand like a modern car from a good manufacturer. We understand that there was a lot of work done that we don't think about to make sure it's safer than than previous generation. So in many yeah. ways, I don't want consumers to think or like users and users to think about wait a second, what what am I using here? Am I using Web two or Web three? But rather, uh, like it, it will be this kind of slow and uh, gradual shift to technologies that just better protect your interest in those specific domains. However, it will not happen automatically. Like what we need to do is two things. First of all, education, like explain people why in many things this is better because, you know, just like uh, eventually it, it boils down to convenience, right? So web two was very convenient. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to pay for anything. You just uh, open the browser and uh, that's it. And you have uh, everything at your fingertips and absolutely for free. The problem is that all of your data is not yours. You don't control anything. You don't really know what's happening. So what we need to pr pr do is build this gradual shift from this current situation, which is, in my opinion, it just gotten too far, right? It's, it's a question of balance, right? Too many things are now in the cloud, not yours, not controlled by you. Uh, too much information is being collected about you. Information that you don't necessarily, uh, like, not, not necessarily needed for anything. It's just collected because they can collect it and then they will figure out what to do with it later. Uh, things yeah. like that. So, yeah. And a lot of, a lot of like the Web2 companies, I'm thinking stuff like Snapchat and weird like tech companies like this, they they almost had no monetization and were like worth a lot of money and with the idea of like we'll figure out the monetizing it later on kind of thing. yeah because money was cheap there was a lot of investments uh the growth yeah. model was the prevalent one so we will grow we will grow yeah. into you know this uh, crazy big uh, uh you know platform and then when we are this size then we will figure out how to monetize it and this is what we're seeing right now, because right now the money is more expensive because the interest rate is up. And now they're struggling to find um, basically additional funding. Uh, and they are doing all these kinds of Twitter blue and raising API prices on Reddit and all these monetization things. Some of them are OK. Some of them are less uh, accepted by the community on this platform. But all of them will be uh, searching for this. Uh, you know, sources of, of income. And the problem is that one of the easiest sources for that income is selling your data more, right? They've been selling your data yeah. until now, but now they will do it even harder. Yeah, for sure. Um, so a lot of the tr monetization in most of these platforms came from advertising. Um, mm. Thankfully, I, I don't... You know, I don't see ads anymore. I use Adblock. I don't know who is not using Adblock. Uh, but like every once in a while, when I happen to be at some other's computer where there is no Adblock, I get really amazed how many ads there are on every page. Oh, yeah, it's crazy. Like I, I think I mentioned this last time, like my Spotify account ran out and... Now I'm getting ads like every 30 seconds, mid-song and this kind of stuff. I couldn't believe it. It was so funny. Uh, I, I, maybe I told it last time as well because we did talk about advertising things, but uh, my neighbors uh, had a party. Did they tell you about it? Uh, maybe not. Maybe so not. So they used, they used unpaid Spotify account to play music at their party. Okay. So I had yeah. to listen to a lot of ads full volume from... from you know, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I, I've been doing this lately too. I mean, are, are you my neighbor? <laughs> <laughs> I, I find myself playing something and, and then an ad comes on, and oh my God, I, bet I turn that off so no one knows I can't afford Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on, like you're organizing a party, you know, pay for Spotify, yeah. like a few bucks, come on. Anyway, um, yeah. so an important point here is. 
in the Web3 world, that's not going to happen because you will pay for everything. That, that's like one of the things that people have to realize that uh, it's, in my opinion, it's better to pay a little for things that you really use than not pay and have to see all of these ads and donate all of your data to basically anyone. And there is a very good point, uh, which um, uh, Louis Grossman from, from that uh, YouTube that I mentioned a lot recently uh, made. And he said, if you like, uh, if you like this account or this channel, just donate, donate $1 and it will be worth like to, to, to the creator, it, it will be as if you watched, I don't know, 10,000 ads. Yeah. Yeah. Because the ads are monetized uh, by click per thousand, per million. And uh, uh, in, in comparative terms, if you donate $1, then it's like you have been watching uh, and listening to a lot of ads and you save your time. You save your time because you don't, you know, listen to all those ads, and from the creator point of view, it's even better. Um, so this model is solvable, and what is very nice is that the crypto world is amazingly well suited for that because you have these tokens and you have all the interesting ways to transfer them, starting from micropayment platforms like the Lightning Network, which, by the way, is being integrated. Uh, every once in a while, I hear news of uh, different platforms, including centralized and decentralized adding, uh, you know, adding these uh, Lightning Network uh, support. And also you have all kinds of blockchains. You have, you can create new tokens. You can do uh, smart contracts that allocate them in any way you like and implement any business logic you like. So the blockchain and crypto world is very well suited for this style or, or like business model, I would say. And as a creator, you're better off. You're better off because you uh, you, you get your, okay, your your funding in a way that you like. You control your community, and you're not selling neither you yourself nor your users' data to any platform. Yeah, and I I feel like uh, we saw this a little bit like last cycle in the bull market. We saw this a little bit with NFTs. I reckon, like people are willing to pay to support obviously it got a little bit out of hand and crazy but people are willing to pay to like support people and and this kind of thing especially in crypto when you're paying for each transaction uh like you're paying for anything you do pretty much this is what i always tell my my girlfriend because she's always asking me like will it cost me to to send this will it cost me to do that do this and i'm saying like everything you do costs money <laughs> and and so i feel like crypto people will at least be uh more used to it a little bit i i totally agree and uh, uh there was this idea even about email back in the day that if you paid uh, a fraction of a cent to send an email then this uh, spamming would have uh you know be been more, more contained but the problem is that there was no infrastructure to charge that and yeah. in the crypto world, there is exactly this infrastructure already existing. And you can even uh, create, so, so, you know, Ethereum is too, uh, I don't know, expensive for that. No problem. Use uh, layer two, use bridge, use uh, sidechain. Anything works uh, because the architecture, you can build it in a very flexible way. Uh, while still being able to preserve the source of truth in a reliable location. And this is actually the next point, because when people talk about Web3, sometimes it seems like, okay, we're throwing out everything we have right now, and we're building a new world, which will be Web3, and nobody is advocating that. I think a lot of the infrastructure that we have will remain exactly as it is, and it will be still centralized, and it will be still monitored and provided by large corporations. However, the important things, which is the source of truth, like where the information resides, might be on blockchain. The tokenomics will go through blockchain. And uh, in terms of the control of how you, uh, like who, who is actually sitting on this uh, button that can turn it on or off or, or, or do something with it, it will no longer be with those corporations. So you will pay more or like you will pay for the infrastructure. Because, for example, on Twitter, I think you can now upload 
full videos? Yeah, and like hour long ones and stuff like that, right? Crazy. And like, uh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, okay, uh, m maybe somebody, but I, I think the recent phenomenon was about this video that Elon Musk promoted uh, the one like about the women, like who, who are women. You remember that one? Uh, I, I know the, I don't know the name of it, but I know the guy. I don't know him, but I, I, I know what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. So, I can't remember so about the It whole, was uploaded like, to Twitter and uh, heavily promoted, had a lot of views. But that's not the point. The point is somebody has to pay for that storage and the traffic because when you stream the video, somebody it should be obviously safe some, somewhere, but also uh, it's very expensive to simultaneously stream it to millions of people. Um, yeah. And somebody is paying for that. Now, this is something that you will still pay for in some way because you know, eventually the servers cost money and the traffic costs money and the infrastructure costs money. However, the difference is that it will be more like you pay for your electricity and you know they can turn you on and off, but they don't control whether you plug in your toaster or your oven or your lamp, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, which is, by the way, interestingly... Uh, in some in some areas, weirdly, and, and it's really crazy. Did you hear about this uh, BMW uh, adding subscription features for your car? Did you hear about that? Oh wow! I I thought you were going to say your BMW like communicating with your toaster. No 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 no! no, no it's even that. funnier. A subscription so, model. Yeah yeah. yeah. Okay. You you can buy heated heated <laughs> seats in your car using the subscription. So, you, like, you have to... Pay every month for your heated seats to work. Holy shit. You didn't hear about it? It's a crazy story. No. Yeah. This is wild. So, okay. you buy a car. Uh, uh, like, yeah. like, how does it work? Like, why is it even uh, profitable? Because then they have to do less uh, customizations. So, by default, they put heated seats in all cars. They don't start, like, did you pay for heated seats? Did you not pay for heated seats? It's like, by default, it's there. But then, in order to use it, you pay subscription, monthly subscription. And Mercedes has started doing that with horsepower. So you, your car has, I don't know, 300 horsepower. But if you pay, <laughs> you can get access to 300 and, I don't know, 50. How did I not hear this? This is the, one of the craziest things I've, uh, I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's absolutely unbelievable. You, you, you know, Google it up. Uh, BMW people are, features. It, it's absolutely amazing. People in, that's crazy. People in the in the Telegram chat are talking about jailbreaking like smart TVs, and, and little do they know they're going to be having to jailbreak their cars very shortly. Yeah, no, I for them. The longer I live, the more I find. Like, I think my current car is way too smart and has way too many electronics. Yeah. So yeah, my I'm, next one will probably going to be this kind of you know manual cranky old piece of shit. Nice. I I'm currently carless, so I I I dream of cars, and <laughs> whenever like the Bitcoin and crypto markets are going up, I sometimes like search car sites on the internet, and then the next day the crypto market crashes. <laughs> that's uh, my. On the other that's hand, my, you like, live in a city with great public experience. transportation and huge uh, congestion charges. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, like I yeah. I think I've talked to you about this in like uh, in in our meetings. It's, it's wild. Yeah. So um, yeah. So that's the point. Like in some in some industries, they're trying to move backwards. They're trying to say, no, no, no. You are not going. Like you, you will own nothing and you will love it, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, I think that in in our Web three case, this is exactly the opposite. Like we will say, listen, it will be your data. It will be your responsibility more than it is today. Which is, by the way, also interesting because uh, you know, first of all, people today don't delete anything ever. Yeah. And uh, uh, it, it's it's okay because you know every once in a while you know you do need some old things maybe but uh, at least i don't know archive it or do something but everything is there somewhere in the cloud on somebody else's computer uh, and you yeah. hope it's safe and you hope that it's okay but we know it's not yeah and uh, yeah. yeah so this this is going to be different and it, it will take a lot of time to uh, kind of adapt to this new reality but i think that if we do um like move forward with it and i will talk about privacy in a second because after all 
like where does BIM fit, fit into all this and like why am I so excited to talk about it uh, outside of my natural curiosity for these things. So uh, I think the authentication and digital identity will change a lot in the next few years uh, and you will have a different ways of authenticating yourself because we see even today that uh, you know email is not enough, uh, social login is not enough, you still have to use two-factor and if you're using two-factor, maybe it doesn't need to be you know, email and something. It can be different mechanisms that we, we will see. And uh, Connect Wallet and all of these seed-based authentications, I think, will become more popular. And I have some ideas about that, but they're still kind of work in progress, so I will not talk about them. Um, and also the privacy, because the privacy is, um, right now, it's non-existent in 90% or 95% uh, of, applica of Web2 applications that you are using. So yes, like when you're using messengers like WhatsApp or Telegram, they all advertise as end-to-end -end encrypted. Uh, and even if you assume they are, and obviously there are signals that really are encrypted end-to-end, -end, um, this is just a small part of, of the entire picture, right? Because everything else, the emails are not encrypted and your Facebook and your Twitter, and like everything is completely out in the open about you. And uh, we know that not only is it used by the company that's actually hosting it and the government and people who have access and it's sold every once in a while, like we saw with this case with Facebook that uh, sold it to Cambridge Analytica or whatever. Um, it, it's, it's getting really bad because the more you depend on these platforms, the more information about you is there. And today I think it's, like, I really try to think about, you know, important things that are not being manifested in one of these electronic means, right? So, like, I, if something happened in my life, I probably talked about it in Telegram uh, or in, in the email or in Twitter, right? Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> and, and that's about it, right? And everybody sees it and everybody, like not just people that I want to see it. Like if it's public, it's public. But even if I send an email to someone, right, which is not supposed to be public information, we all know that in, in reality, we, we should treat it as just like you have tweeted it. Yeah. Um, so when we're talking about privacy, also these uh, models of Web3 have an advantage because they allow more granular control because the information is not just being sent to some cloud and just sitting there. You have a bit uh, kind of more refined control of how you protect it. But once again, it requires understanding and um, uh, the understanding is not necessarily technical in, in nature, but it's more like a habit that you develop. So, for example, and, and this is something that is hugely missing. Like, I, I don't know how the situation is with schools in, you know, in your country, but here, for example, there is absolutely zero education about, uh, uh, you know, digital hygiene of any kind. Like, yeah, nothing here either. And I find it so strange because we all know, like, you know, <laughs> any conversation about privacy or uh, the, let's say the anti-privacy, the necessity for the government to monitor everything starts with protecting the children, as we know, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. We will scan all the phones in the world to protect the children, but we will not invest even, I don't know, anything to have a class or a hour, a week or a year, I don't know what, to... to explain to children what sh they should and or should not do with their phones yeah i think it's crazy like i think it's uh, it's absolutely amazing and, uh, and i mean like w w they don't teach classes about this and they don't <clears throat> one thing that i like when i went to school computers were almost not a thing as well and we had we had a few computers but didn't know how to use them and and also didn't get taught but we also didn't get taught anything about like money <laughs> which i found now find yeah it's it's, it's probably a conversation for another time but yes yeah uh, they yeah. don't teach the important things <laughs> no yeah they, <laughs> they teach like algebra which i don't know it's pretty depending what you do uh, it's, it's, you it definitely would be great if like first lesson <laughs> in in the university like you come and the first lesson everybody you know 
uh, write it down, salary negotiations. <laughs> yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. Instead, like what, what do you coaches. have to do? <laughs> yeah. What do you have to do after you leave high school? Oh, you have to like get a job, negotiate a salary, pay tax. Like let's not teach any of that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, back back to back to Web three. So yeah, so I, I, that's exactly the point that um, the, it will take time to adjust, but it it, it does happen in many areas uh, that we, like for example, like I, I think most people have a code on their phone today, right? They have some kind of a code, uh, whether it's very difficult to break or not. But there was this understanding that okay, I don't want my phone because it has everything in it to be lying around and everybody can take a look at it, so I will protect it with the code, which is nice. Uh, and you put a password, like more and more people are putting passwords on their laptops, right? So which is nice because by default, that's what uh, the operating system nudges you to do. So this is exactly the method of promoting this, right? It's like nudges. You say, listen, you could do it like this, but here, this is the default. By default, you you don't open it to everyone, uh, which is exactly the opposite, by the way, of what Web2 platforms were doing. Because in Web2 platforms, all of the defaults were always for the most profit for the platform, which, like, you know, obviously means less privacy and less control for you. Uh, yeah. I was amazed to find that there is a setting in an iPhone that shows all of the locations that you have visited in the last, I don't know. Oh, wow. Yeah. And in order to disable it, you need and clear this list. You need to go into the settings, into something, privacy, blah, blah, and then clear it, right? Yeah. yeah. So if you, yeah, because by default, they're collecting it as much as possible. And this is the point where these defaults should change and it can come. I, I don't think that like, it should come from uh, like I, it's obviously it's going, not going to come from the corporations. I think it's going to come from more education, more understanding, uh, talking about it. Uh, by the way, uh, let, let's take, for example, uh, browsers, right? So Chrome uh, and like many other browsers have this privacy mode, like right? incognito mode. Yeah. And I think like, uh, it's actually an interesting question to Paul. How, how, how much, like, what percentage of browser users actually knows about it? Yeah, this is this would be interesting. I would say, I would I would like to think many would know about it, but I assume like I, <laughs> probably a very small number do. Yeah, I, I will I will do some some googling about it. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> after the state because it's interesting, right? But. The point is that it's relatively easily accessible and it does provide some privacy like on, on top of what we're regularly using. Um, yeah. And like, why is it there? It's there because there was a need. Like some people said, okay, every once in a while, I want to visit the website without the cookies, without the kind of uh, all of the history and the basically answer. because when you're in the regular mode, when you're, especially if you're logged in into the browser with Google, almost anything you're clicking, doing, or typing is going to the to the system, right? To to the yeah. cloud. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that there are examples of these useful technologies being promoted and used eventually by everybody, even without too much technical knowledge. And what we need to do, in my opinion, like, and what we will try to uh, to do, especially at Beam, is to um, make these kind of you know, adjustments and developments uh, both from the infrastructure, but that's one point, but also in terms of the applications and how we use them to investigate this Web3 way of doing things. Because in many cases, and I think the best example that I always talk about is source, uh, because GitHub or Git like in general is very well adjusted to exactly this model. Uh, every project is a community mm -hmm. of sorts. It has a relatively small number of developers, maybe 10,000, but it's still not millions. And there is a lot of communication within the community. There is a data and the metadata uh, that can be stored on IPFS. And then you can access it through the blockchain. You have a lot of version tracking and other kind of um, interesting tracking options through the blockchain, which is great because they're immutable and you can always know uh, when this change was made by looking at the block time, uh, which is, by the way, one of the annoying things when you open an article and there is no date on it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, blockchain solves this, right? That's, that's... Yeah, for sure. Or the origin, like what was the origin of that article? How can I trace it? 
So all of these things are uh, very solvable by blockchain technologies. Um, so yeah, that, so we, we're going to explore these different interesting applications uh, for Web3. Uh, obviously, Beam is in, first and foremost at this point an infrastructure provider, but uh, infrastructure alone cannot make this happen. So it's much more important uh, to create applications that people will actually use. And I think the most important goal is right now is also to choose the best uh, market feed. Like, don't, don't try to replicate Twitter right now. It's not possible. It's going to be ugly and it will not work. Rather, we, we need to find a better suited cases for the Web3 model, both in terms of the architecture and usage, and try to attack those first, because that's where we have more chances of succeeding, of actually creating something that people will use. Yeah, and it, it's it's always like, uh, at, at least what I've found in in the whole Web three thing is that it's a very easy like thing to attach to, like where the decentralized Twitter or where the decentralized. Uh, I mean, I can uh, now I started saying this. I can only think of crazy ones like decentralized maps or decentralized, uh, <laughs> whatever. Uh, but it. it I think it's very difficult to like dethrone Twitter or dethrone all of these big like services that people are using. Whereas need to need to focus on like what crypto is doing and and like these smaller niche communities and then growing from there. Absolutely, that's that's what I think as well. Um, yeah, I think uh, Reddit is actually a good starting point uh, because yeah, it's mostly text. Uh, one of the problems is always with storing large amounts of uh, media. Uh, you need more mm. infrastructural changes to happen before we can really solve that. Uh, everything that's about text, about interactions in more kind of, um, uh, I would say, no, non-media driven forms uh, as of now. Um, and, uh, you know, this is actually, this is actually one of the, uh, I would say primary directions that I want to focus my investigations and research in is to understand which models or which services can be um, more interestingly moved or like migrated to Web3 technologies. Um, so yeah, I, I will just repeat my, my question from the tweet that I published. Like if you find any interesting information, like really high level, like, like in terms of uh, quality, research or discussions or groups or forums that talk about these things, uh, please send them to me, like send them to Twitter, uh, because as of now, there are really few resources that dive deeper than just a uh, high level overview of everything that's happening. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I, I'm struggling to reply because I'm typing your message as we speak. <laughs> I'll send it off to the space. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, we didn't talk much about Beam and updates. There were a few. Uh, the new version of the Blockchain Explorer was released. It's still work in progress, but it's you know much better. Yeah, we did. We did also have a couple of questions come in, and the first one is with regards to buy and sell taxes for Dex trades. Uh, and as I understand, the DEX at the moment has like a fixed slippage. And if I guess if someone created a confidential asset that had a buy tax or a sell tax that was outside the the realms of that slippage, then it would be impossible to trade on the on the DEX. Uh, yeah. So uh, when we have built the DEX, we have said that the first version is going to be very simple. And um, hmm. we didn't want to complicate things, uh, definitely not for, for, you know, for the initial release. But there are actually a lot of interesting possibilities to improve it, expand it, and create new, new things. And like, this is definitely one of them. Um, in general, the slippage control is something that we are uh, working on like, to give more control to the user uh, of how, like how to uh, parameterize all the transactions when you're, when you're going to trade on DEX. So yes, it's something that we've been working on. Uh, yeah, like uh, these, these ideas are uh, I I somewhere in the list and uh, we're slowly moving towards implementing it. Yeah, wicked. And, and like 
the DEX does open up so many like opportunities and different use cases and, and kind of quirky and weird and wonderful stuff that can happen. So looking forward to it. The second question was covered, I think, in the last space a little bit. Uh, and it's just w with regards to a generic kind of lock for AMML. Yeah. So the liquidity tokens for the, the DEX and having a DAP that's easily or easy to lock up those tokens. Yeah. So this is also something that, okay. So first of all, uh, I have created a new board. Um, uh, it's not very well populated. I'm still working on that, but all of the issues will also appear there. Uh, and uh, this is going to be definitely one of them, like one of the applications that we will create. Uh, another one will be, as I said, the application that allows to burn tokens and uh, also to convert tokens from white, one type into another. That's also something in the works. Nice. Uh, most of this week, we were actually focused on fixing um, dApps for mobile devices. We, we had some uh, strange issues with specifically with Android that were still resolving. So most of the week was um, invested into that. But uh, yeah, like all of these things uh, are definitely relevant. And uh, uh, I, I just need to finally organize uh, you know, br bring everything together, all the things that were discussed, and uh, uh, put them on one board. It will be easier to manage. So I will, I will get to that in the next couple of days. Why can't? Um, yeah, it was, it was very nice. So, like, I, I'm really interested in this topic. I'm really uh, reading a lot about it and trying to find uh, more and more resources. So. Once again, if you see something, please let me know. Uh, mostly interested in non-financial applications at the moment, because I think the financial applications and the NFTs are pretty well covered. And uh, I would like to look elsewhere for more interesting and in-depth analysis. Um, yeah. yeah. And uh, I, I, will, I will create some article that will kind of summarize some of the thoughts that I talked about today. So just to make it uh, you know, even more organized and open for discussion. Um, and uh, it, it was very nice being here as usual. And uh, thank you very much. And we'll see you next week. Thank you, Alex. As always, a pleasure. And, and look forward to the next space. Thank you, man. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.